I absolutely agree with the future is going to be LTE. I would have some debate with Gordon about the timescales and the standards and everything else. And I'm sure there are at least 37 different views about timescales and standards within this room, never mind just between Gordon and myself. The bit that I do completely disagree with the UK government is I disagree on their choice of having no spectrum for the emergency services. I do not believe it is a sensible way to run the world without control, not necessarily dedicated, but control over spectrum for the emergency services going forward. So when you ask me questions and when I give my viewpoints, you just have to bear in mind I have views and those are the views that I will present rather than necessarily a, a standard and vanilla view. Technological advancements are critical to the future of emergency services, but technology only facilitates and supports change. Uh, for those people who are in the earliest, earlier seminar, then it was spoken about you require the users to adapt their operations to maximise the value of these technologies. And this is critical. Budgets are shrinking. Risk to public safety is increasing. If you don't maximise the value of the new technology, you have wasted your money. If you forget the people and the processes, you will never get the technology to deliver its potential. The question is what technologies are poised to make a big impact on emergency services? Poised is a bit, is a bit difficult in a five-year time frame. Um, if you're considering five years, Poised means it has to be available today. It is not going to make a big impact if someone, it is just a dream in someone's mind as it stands at the moment. The emergency services do not adopt new technologies on a whim. They look for long-term and large-scale investments. Smartphones. Smartphones are undoubtedly one of the big key changes to come along to everyone's world, not just public safety. The use by the public and emergency service will drive change. Currently, Ofcom say that 66% of UK adults own a smartphone, and this figure is only going to rise. As smartphones increase their features, processing and storage capabilities, they will come, become an essential tool in their own right. We will discuss the applications later on. The previous session was about video and the storage and retrieval of video. Actually, video, video and body-worn video is a real double-edged sword. Not only does it capture large amounts and volumes of data, it is actually a drive for behavioural change. The man with the camera on his chest or the man looking into himself being filmed will understand that that film will appear in court. So maybe the first punch wouldn't necessarily be thrown because it's very difficult to dispute camera evidence. So therefore people behave in a different fashion when they're appearing on telly, as I am behaving differently now. Sensors. We're seeing an explosion in personal sensors. I don't know how many people have told me how many steps they've taken today and how many steps they've yet got to do before they hit their target, before they get to the end of the day. Over time, these monitors will become smaller. They'll be printed onto your skin. They'll be inserted under your skin. You'll swallow them. They will tell you whether you've taken your medicines or not. As such, health and health care will become far more preemptive. Monitoring devices will enable preemptive advice and early diagnosis. But this will also bring its own data issues. Imagine if you collapse on the street and you have your Gen 27 Fitbit on that, that uh, you've had for the last three years. Would you want the first person that turns up to have access to the data that's in there? On one hand, it might contain something that will save your life but that person may be unqualified and may do some things wrong with the data and it could end your life. So what do you do with the data that is stored within your own personal device? The mass market adoption of these personal centres will obviously spill into the emergency services. We already use them in fire to, to, to monitor stress levels and temperature. We, might, we use them to monitor when guns are withdrawn or, or pepper sprays are going to withdraw. The mass market and the millions that sit behind it will generate new things that we haven't yet thought about. Data. It's data, 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 and even more data. 
The gathering, distribution and large-scale data manipulation will facilitate more efficient and better decision-making. It will help create the platforms for new ways of working. Intelligent middleware will join seemingly unrelated events and allow data to be presented as useful information to the users. Again, at the previous session, people talked about data overload. It is about converting data to information. Data is useless as data. Data will be collected from sensors, it will be collected from cameras. It will also be input into systems by either the emergency service or the public at large themselves. Mobile data entry is finally making headway in the UK. If I go back to 2005, 2006, we launched a data division to sell data services to the emergency services. Only now, in 2016, is Pronto, our data suite application, being used by one third of the UK police forces. I cannot believe it has taken 11 years for public safety to catch up to what the rest of the world has been doing for the last 10. There are some very simple things you get from data entry. Obviously, no rekeying. One of the other ones is domestic incidents tend to reoccur in the same households on a regular basis. So it saves time if you can copy and paste the previous information and do it again, because that's exactly what they're doing with their lives as well. Drones are already fitted with thermal imaging technology, and that assists with finding people and also to evaluate hotspots within fires. Drones can track your own movements. It's not a big step for them to move forward and recognize and track suspects in a crowd. If you look further on, you can also see drones following the Amazon route. Slightly different, they will deliver critical equipment and medicines to otherwise inaccessible people or places in times of crisis. There is a lot the emergency services can learn from the commercial world. And this one might be slightly contentious. How can you say what new technologies are going to make it poised to make an impact and then look at PMR? But LTE is not new either. LTE has been around for how many years? And before that, 3G. And really, LTE is just a quicker version of 3G. It's obvious that the likes of Norway and Germany, where their networks have only just been completed, they have more to gain from the efficiencies that the common communication systems deliver. But working practices continue to involve in both Holland and the UK, where these systems have been in place for over 10 years. New technology does not automatically mean change. New technology facilitates and support change. But the blue light services do not change their operating procedures on a whim. Trust has to be gained, and the benefits and risks fully, fully understood before change is undertaken. Be careful what you wish for. Killer apps. What is the killer app for public safety? What is the broadband killer app for public safety? In the UK, it's voice. Without this being available for trial later this year and in the user's hands next year, the move to ESN in the UK will not happen. So as far as the UK is concerned, voice is the killer app. The previous session, video. Why is video the killer app? Because users say it is. They, they struggle when you ask them the second question or the third question or the fourth question about what they're going to do with all of this video and they're how going to analyze it and how they're going to store it. But it is always the first answer to the, every question you ask about broadband services. If you're not doing mission critical voice and you're not doing video, you don't need LTE. You can run the rest of the services on 2G, 3G, TEDS or Tetra. It is only video and mission critical voice that drives the requirement for LTE. As we move to more broadcast type features within LTE, then the business case for video will be easier to swallow. Another slightly strange one, access to the worldwide apps marketplace is actually a killer app in its own right. We don't know which one of the many millions it will be, but some of them will turn out to be invaluable. End users will drive the, the need for apps. Niche users with the emergency services. They will develop and deliver particular items for their own use. This will create many challenges, though, when it comes to security, as if the need is not filled from within the organization, 
the users will go out and do it themselves, and that will create an even greater security risk and challenge. But there have been failures along the way, if you look at the commercial world, but they should not be feared. We all make mistakes. Friends Reunited had 24 million users in 2010. It closed in 2016. But if you look at what it did, you could consider it an early Facebook, an early LinkedIn, an early Match.com. They're all making money today, or losing lots of money, depending on who you are. So Friends Reunited are a nobody anymore. Probably done in Phil's time. But mission critical in public safety is defined by the TCA, TCCA as a function that is extremely important or necessary for a public safety organization, emergency agency, first responder, to operate successfully and efficiently and whose failure leads to a catastrophic degradation of service that places public order or public safety and security at immediate risk. Another way of phrasing that in a shorter sentence is, I believe when it fails, it has the potential to endanger life. So when will broadband enable applications transition from business critical to mission critical? There must be at least 27 dates that I've heard during this last two days. Is it 12? Is it 13? Is it 14? Do we have to wait for 15? Do we have to wait for standards? Will it be driven by features? Will it be driven by time? For an application to be considered mission critical, then the underlying network, its operation, its security, its resilience and its availability must also be accepted as mission critical. Ultimately, it will not be the network operators, the application developers or the service providers that will decide when something is mission critical. It will be the users and the ultimate test will be when they decide to turn off their existing mission critical PMR systems. That is when Mission Critical really has been delivered. Any questions, Phil? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ross. Uh, an interesting insight into the world of public safety uh, uh, communications. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any uh, questions? Yes, sir. Hi, Peter John from Saab. Um, given Airwave and our Motorola company, and Motorola are Motorola owning... Solutions, please. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> are, are owning and operating the ESN network as well. How seamless is this relationship between Airwave and ESN with your customers going to be? And, and how is that going to support things like mission critical? applications, are you going to be cooperating with ESN to find optimal ways of using both networks or are they going to be dealing with the two systems separately? Um, as, as, as you say, Airwave was acquired by Motorola Solutions in February um, and we have great plans to work together closely. Unfortunately, the, um, there is a mergers commission going on at the moment and so that is currently sitting quietly. We are helping with lot two, and lot two is the um, user services within ESN. And we're also helping with upgrading the existing airwave network so it will facilitate interconnectivity between ESN and the existing Tetra. But if I go back into the history of ESN, they didn't need dual mode devices, now they do. They didn't need in interconnectivity, and now they do. So as they evolve, then we will evolve and we will answer. We are passionate. Everyone with an airwave has a passion about public safety. We will not be turning our back. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Martin Sonner, I'm a consultant. Uh, why do you think uh, that you need a dedicated spectrum for mission critical services? I'm, I'm, I'm Maybe I phrased it incorrectly. I don't believe you necessarily need dedicated spectrum. I said you need control over spectrum. And the reason you need control over spectrum is otherwise the only thing you have left is pounds, shillings and pence. For those people who are old enough, yes, pounds, shillings and pence, otherwise it's pounds and pence these days, I think. Um, 
how, how can you drive change in an organization if all you have is money? And how can you deliver cost efficiencies if all you have to do is spend money to get those changes? You need control of something that everyone values and everyone values spectrum. Commercial networks will be part of the future. There, there are very few countries in the world that can afford their own dedicated LTE network. So I absolutely support the use of commercial networks, but I also support the control of spectrum by emergency services so they can pick and choose who they work with and actually have a lever that's worth something other than money. I would fully support you there, Ross. I, must I thought you might, Phil. <laughs> Um, maybe I could just ask one question. You've been working with the user community for the last 16 years. Do you think that um, the speed of adoption of these new technologies is going to be dictated to by the, the rollout of the technologies, or is it going to be adopt, uh, uh, as a result of the, uh, the, the willingness of the end user community to actually take up all this uh, new functionality? It was an interest in two sides of the debate earlier on about the pace of change and how change is going to be driven by the, by the, the lower level users. There, there is a far greater drive from end users now, the people who use the systems day in, day out, which is putting pressure on the people who pay the bills, and they're the ones that will ultimately, ultimately make the decisions. Um, there is far more drive into the IT teams now from the end users than the IT teams pushing it out. Um, how will it all shape out? At the end of the day, the bill, bill payers will still make the decisions and they do not spend their money on a whim or unwisely. The rollout will be slower than is possible. The rollout will not be as quick as the end users would wish, but hopefully less mistakes will be made along the way.